I'll let senators take their seats and I'll call. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Leave is granted. Uh, I thank the Senate. I advise the Senate that Senator Payne will be absent from question time today due to ministerial business overseas. Uh, in Senator Payne's absence, Senator Birmingham will represent the Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Minister for Women, the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, the Attorney General and the Minister for Industrial Relations. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Chisholm. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Following representations by Minister Taylor, then Minister Frydenberg's office arranged a meeting which took place on 20 March 2017 between Minister Taylor, Minister Frydenberg's office and members of the Department of the Environment and Energy to discuss a listing which affected Mr Taylor's private landholding. How many other farmers affected by this listing got this special treatment? The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, I thank the Senator for his question. As uh, has been made very clear, uh, the member for Hume uh, requested briefing in relation to the listing uh, as a result of uh, constituent and electorate interest in the matter. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. One of the members of the department in attendance at that meeting was a compliance officer from the unit responsible for investigating Minister Taylor's company for allegedly poisoning hectares of critically endangered grasslands. How many landowner, landowners under investigation by the department are given this special treatment? No. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I again draw the Senator's attention to the statements that have been made that Mr Taylor did not ask for or indeed even know that the officer present at the meeting order, was order. a compliance Senator, officer. Senator Birmingham, Senator Wong on a point of order. A point of order. I'm reluctant to do it so quickly, but given the last answer was only about nine seconds long, uh, references to past statements are not directly relevant to the question. This question is how many others got this special treatment, how many other landowners. I think the public are entitled to know that. The government is saying he did, you know, this was perfectly fine. He, Minister Taylor can ask, demand this. How many, how many other landowners um, got this special treatment? Senator Wong, I'm reluctant to say that references to past statements are by that nature um, not directly relevant. And I thought the minister was actually addressing the first part of the question. That was the preamble to the bit you just reminded him of. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I was indeed making the point, uh, given the question referenced the attendance of a compliance officer at the meeting, uh, that Mr. Taylor has been clear. He did not know that there was a compliance officer present at the meeting. Uh, I'd further highlight the statement of the Secretary of the Department of the Environment, who has said very clearly on the record, and I quote, in relation to compliance, I can be very clear that Minister Taylor has never raised the issue with me. In relation to the insinuation that somehow nobody else is concerned about this issue, uh, can I draw the Senate's attention uh, to a letter, a joint letter from New South Wales Farmers and the National Farmers Federation, dated 3 October 2017, re, and I quote, EPBC listing natural temperate grasslands of the southeastern highlands of New South Wales and the ACT. This clearly was an issue of interest to farming interests across this region, including Order. the local Senator MP. Senator Birmingham, time for the answer has expired. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How many attendees of the meeting were made aware of Minister Taylor's direct interest in the matters being discussed? Did Minister Taylor declare his interest at the start of the meeting? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I note that uh, the Department uh, of Environment has already addressed and answered questions in relation to, uh, to these matters. I would refer the Senate to that Hansard and, uh, and equally invite uh, the Senate, if it would like, in terms of its general interest in this topic and desire to appreciate uh, that this was a matter Senator of broader what, concern. Point, Senator what on a point of order? On, on relevance, we haven't had an answer to any of the questions asked so far. This question is asking how many attendees were made aware of the interest, and that hasn't been answered before. We'd appreciate an answer to just one of these three questions um, today. There's an opportunity to debate the merits of any answers after question time. I'm listening carefully to the minister to ensure direct relevance. He's 17 seconds in, um, and I'll call on him to continue. 
Mr. President, in relation to compliance matters, again draw attention to Mr. Uh, to Mr. Taylor's statements that I have never made a representation in relation to compliance matters, and the Secretary of the Department's statement that he can be very clear that Minister Taylor has never raised the matter with him. In relation to what the topic of the briefing was about, which was the general listing, indeed there is other interest in the general listing, as evidenced by the fact that New South Wales Farmers and the National Farmers Federation made representations on it, uh, and I seek leave to table the correspondence from New Order. South Wales Farmers and the National Farmers Federation. Order. Um, you don't need leave. You don't need. Minister doesn't need leave to table. Senator Birmingham's tabled the document. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Defence. Can the minister update the Senate on how Australia is deepening defence cooperation with the United States to ensure a stable, peaceful and prosperous Indo-Pacific region? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator McGrath for that question and for his support for the alliance. Uh, the Australia-US alliance is the cornerstone of Australia's defence and security policy. The strength of our alliance is based on our common values, our shared vision and a commitment to peace, prosperity and also stability in our immediate region and also beyond. It's wonderful to note that we are now in our second century of unbroken mateship and global support and military cooperation. We've got 80 years of diplomatic relations and nearly 70 years of ANZUS cooperation. Our alliance is stronger than ever, and it has never been more important or more vital to us than it is today. Because today Australia faces challenges that are increasing in number and in complexity, challenges that are rapidly redefining our strategic environment. The Morrison government recognises that a modern and enduring Australia-US alliance is absolutely critical if we are to respond to these challenges effectively. This is the message that I relayed to the recently, in fact, the very newly appointed US Secretary of Defence, Mark Esper. I warmly congratulate him on his confirmation and I look forward to working with him. This government is committed to further deepening our defence cooperation with the United States, including through the US Force Posture Initiatives. We are working together to step up engagement with regional countries in the Indo-Pacific, with our neighbours and friends, and we are doing it together. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Can the minister update the Senate on exercise Talisman Sabre, the bilateral Australia-United States military exercise? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Exercise Talisman Sabre reflects the strengths of the Australia and US alliance and the closeness of our military to military relationship. It is our largest and most complex exercise. Over 34,000 military personnel from Australia and the United States participated in Talisman Sabre this year. Talisman Sabre took place at the Defence Shoalwater Bay training area and surrounding state forests near Rockhampton and other locations in Queensland. Force elements from Japan, from Canada, the United Kingdom and also New Zealand joined in the Talisman Sabre. Talisman Sabre provided an excellent opportunity to further enhance interoperability between Australia and the United States. And I'm delighted to report to the Senate that our people, our men and women of the ADF, once again did a magnificent job and did us all proud. I take this opportunity to thank the local community, including landowners, state governments and also the traditional owners. It is without their Order. generous support Senator Reynolds, this could time not have happened. For the expired. Senator McGrath, a supp final supplementary. Can the minister outline to the Senate what other milestones have been achieved in our defence relationship with the United States? Senator Reynolds. Thank you again, Mr President. As I announced earlier today, the Marine Rotational Force Darwin reached a major milestone this week, with 2,500 US Marines now in the Northern Territory. The force has grown in size and complexity since the first rotation of 200 in 2012. This current rotation represents the most capable and operationally focused deployment to date. Delivering on this commitment demonstrates the enduring nature of the Australia-US alliance and on our, share, our shared intent to fully implement the US force posture initiatives. The Marine Rotational Force Darwin provides critical strategic and security benefits for both Australia and also the United States. And by training together, the warfighting capabilities and interoperability of the ADF and the US forces is enhanced. 
And the rotation also provides opportunities to strengthen engagement with other allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific region. Senator Green. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. On Tuesday, when asked about the Liberal National Government targeting Townsville flood victims as part of its robo-debt program, the Minister told the Senate four times, and I quote, there has been no debt recovery undertaken in the Townsville area. Does the Minister stand by her statement? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Mm. Um, thank you very much, and I thank uh, Senator Green for her follow-up question in relation to this, uh, this matter. Um, as I advised um, the senator in the chamber on Wednesday, uh, following her question on Tuesday, uh, I contacted the mayor of Townsville and spoke to Mayor Jenny Hill uh, and explained to Mayor Hill uh, that the, uh, the Department of Social Services uh, had not commenced uh, debt recovery in the Townsville area, uh, and I expressed to, senator, uh, to, to the mayor uh, that there was no intention for that to occur. I did, however, at the time, and I also uh, relayed this information to uh, the senator opposite on, on Wednesday, that if there had been any incident where a debt recovery action had taken place in Townsville and that they were aware of it, they please bring it to my attention so I could take action, because I stand by my comments that no debt recovery has commenced in Townsville, and if by some fluke of accident, a debt recovery action has under, been undertaken that I am unaware of. I wish to know about it so I can stop it. <laughs> Senator Green, a supplementary question. Well, despite the minister giving her assurance to the Senate four times, the minister's own department has directly contradicted the minister, telling the Townsville Bulletin that compliance activity has resumed this month. Can the minister explain to the Senate why her own department contradicted her only one day after giving assurances to the Senate. Senator Rustin. Well, look, thank you, thank you very much, and I thank the senator for her question. Uh, I will reiterate my comments. Um, I give an absolute undertaking to this chamber that debt recovery has not commenced in Townsville, and if my agency or any agency for which falls under my portfolio anybody in my agency has made that comment, they were wrong. It has not commenced and it will not be commencing in the foreseeable future. Order. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Order. Townsville Community Legal Centre's solicitor Michael Murray says that there has been a steady increase in recent weeks of people seeking advice after being hit with a Centrelink debt notice. Will the minister immediately direct her department to cease compliance activity in the Townsville area and to withdraw any notices issued this month? Senator Rustin. Well, look, thank you very much. And I'm not sure whether you didn't actually listen to what I had in response to the question, in that I said that if anybody has got a debt Order. notice, and if you, Senator Green, have got a debt notice that has been issued into any. Order. Order. On my left. Order. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. In response to your question, as I said to an earlier question, to the best of my knowledge, there has been no debt recovery action taken in Townsville. However, as I said to Mayor Hill and as I have said to you both in this chamber per privately and uh, on camera, that if you have got any incident at all, please provide me with the evidence of that and I will ensure that it is immediately stopped. But if you, you do not have... Please, Order. If you have any evidence at all of anybody in the Townsville area having received a debt recovery notice, could you please bring it to my attention and I will ensure it is immediately stopped? Senator Seawitt. Mr President. Order. Mr. Order on my left and my right now. Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Mr President. Um, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, Minister, according to the data from the Department of Social Services, the average amount of time someone spends on Newstart is 156 weeks, that is, three years. Why does the government continually refer to Newstart as a transition payment when it clearly isn't, given the average length of time somebody is on Newstart is three years? Senator Rustin. Look, thank you, thank you very much, and, and I, look, I thank Senator Seawitt for her question. And can I also acknowledge her ongoing and long-standing interest in this particular area? Um, 
first of all, um, nobody has ever said it would be easy to live on New Start, and I can assure you that the government of which I am a member, our absolute number one priority is to make sure that anybody who's currently on New Start is given the best opportunity to be able to get a job. The, the New Start was never meant to be a salary or a wage replacement. It is a safety net. And, uh, I acknowledge that, uh, that, as I said, that it wouldn't be easy to live on Newstart. However, this government remains absolutely committed to anybody who is uh, on Newstart. We will do everything we possibly can to get them a job. Now, the track record that we have in this uh, in this place over the term of this government. Order, Senator Seward, on a point of order. I tried to be pretty specific and ask about why, why the government continues to refer to this as a transition payment when somebody's on it for three years. I'd like to um, the minister to specifically address that issue. Please. You've reminded the minister of the your na nature of your question. I'll listen carefully, and I call the minister to continue. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, as I said, the most important thing that we can do as a government and as a nation for people who find themselves without a job is to create the jobs that they need, and then create the pathways to get access to those jobs. This government, the government of which I'm a member, has a great track record of job creation, with 1.3 jo million jobs created since we've been in government, and we have a plan to create more jobs. Over a million order. more jobs. Senator Rustin, Senator Di Natale, on a point of order. Relevance. I mean, you've drawn the minister uh, to the specific point made in the question. There wasn't a long preamble. It was very direct. It was why does the government refer to New Start as a transitional payment when the average length of time is three years? I ask you to direct the minister to the question. I, I ask the minister to turn to the nature of the question, given that um, she's had an opportunity to address um, relevant material, to be directly relevant to the nature of the length of time or um, the reason the government uses terminology. But she can be relevant, directly relevant, by referring to the length of time people are on New Start as well. That was part of the question. Senate. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And, and in continuing my, my response to the senator to her question. I was actually trying to draw the attention to the senator um, that the creation of jobs is the best way that we can get people off New Start and to make sure that they're on New Start for a shorter period of time. Because if the jobs aren't available in the economy for people who are on New Start who are looking for a job to be able to get a job, then that makes it extremely difficult. And as I said, 1.3 million jobs since we've been in government, a plan to create more than a million more. But it's not just about creating jobs, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. It's also about creating the pathways to those jobs, which we also see is a Order. very important part Time of the government. Time for the answers expired. Senator Seward, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The largest cohort of people receiving New Start is aged between 55 and 64. Why is it fair for the Prime Minister? as reported to be talking about an increase to the age pension when a 64-year-old on Newstart receives $287.90 less a fortnight than a 65-year-old on the age pension. Senator Rustin. Look, thank you very much, and I thank Senator Seward for her follow-up question. Um, we accept that the most important role that we have, and I certainly accept my most important role I have in the development of social policy, is to make sure that we make the lives of every Australian better. And for somebody who hasn't got a job, obviously that is to provide the opportunity for them to get a job. Part of that is both in the, uh, the employment sector, where my colleague um, Senator Cash, who is unfortunately not here this week through her job active, obviously is to provide those pathways and to create the opportunity for people to understand that the jobs are being created in the economy and providing them pathways to get those jobs. But also um, in the disability sector, one of the things that we're doing as a government is investing very strongly in disability employment services to make sure that people with disability have an equally um, strong chance of being able to get a job and to be able to participate in the, in the economy to the level that they want to. Senator Seward, a final supplementary question. Thank you. After housing costs and even with the energy supplement, New Start recipients are left with around $17.65 a day. Could the minister live on $17.65 a day and still be able to afford food, health care, transport and utilities? Senator Rustin. Well, look, thank you very much, and I thank Senator Seward for her follow-up question. Um, and 
As I said before, at the, and the answer to, my, to her original question, nobody is saying it will be easy to live on Newstart. Nobody is saying it would be easy to live without a job. And that is why the absolute focus of this government is to create jobs and to create pathways for people who don't have a job to get on uh, and get on get a job. It is, and so. As I said, and I've said it and said it in both of the answers in previous questions, the focus of this government is absolutely about job creation, job creation and pathways to jobs, so that people who currently are on New Start, the one thing, the promise that this government will give them is we will do everything we possibly can to get them off New Start and into a job. Yeah. Senator Smith. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Coleman. Despite your assurances, Senator Patterson said on Monday, and I quote, I also think it's worthwhile for the government to examine the wisdom of increasing the compulsory superannuation contribution from 9.5 per cent to 12 per cent. Yesterday, Senator Bragg, in his first speech, said, and I quote, I would change direction. Super should be made voluntary for Australians earning under $50,000, and later, I would be inclined to make the whole scheme voluntary. Does the minister agree with Senator Bragg? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. President. Uh, the answer is no, and I've told him that uh, privately. But let me say, <laughs> and now publicly, and now publicly. But let me say, the two senators that you just referenced—what an amazing bunch of people they are! What great senators they are! And you know what? And not only are they great senators for the uh, states of uh, New South Wales and Victoria, they're part of a great team. They're part of a team which is building a stronger economy, uh, which, is creating, which is creating better opportunities for Australians to get ahead. And they're part of a team of people that were elected by the Australian people to again form a government. And you know why that is? That is because people across Australia understood that it was our team that would help build a stronger economy. It, was, it would be our team that would help create more jobs. It would be our team that would help ensure that Australians uh, can be safe and secure. And they understood and they rejected the politics of envy pursued by the Labor Party. They rejected the high taxing, anti-business, sneering at the top end of town agenda, which Australians understood would have made our economy weaker, would have made our country weaker, would have left every Australian worse off. So I'm very proud of every single member of our team here in the Senate. Let me say, let me tell you, they all make a fantastic contribution in their respective states and as part of our team here in this chamber. And all, all of course, all of us uh, are entitled to our individual views, but we act as a team. We act as a team uh, and we act in the, in the public interest, consistent with the commitments we made to the Australian people before the last election. Senator Smith, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Um, sorry, Minister, will you rule out the consideration of delaying or stopping superannuation guarantee increases or making superannuation voluntary from the slated review into retirement incomes? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I think that's the third time that I've now uh, answered these questions. I referred to my previous answers. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, how can Australians trust this government when it comes to protecting their retirement incomes, when an ever-growing number of government members are undermining your assurances that their super guarantee increases Order will proceed as right. outlined in law? Order. I, I can't recall for whom it is first questions, but can we just show a little modicum of that, given uh, we are in the first weeks of the new Senate? Senator Cormann. Well, the answer to the question is that the Australian people have made a decision on who they trust with their retirement savings. They decided that they could trust us and that they couldn't trust the Labor Party. And that is because the Labor Party went to the election with a promise to take $30 billion out of their superannuation savings. And that is, and that is even before uh, we talk about the retiree tax and the housing tax and the higher taxes on income. Let me tell you, the Australian people know precisely who they can trust with their retirement savings, and they certainly also know that they can't trust the Labor Party. Senator Hanson. Um, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Mackenzie, representing the Minister for Water. Australia's population has grown by 5 million, or 25 per cent, since 2007. During this 12-year period, the price of water has increased dramatically, causing hardship for rural and regional communities. 
This hardship could have been avoided if the government had invested in water security and not become the single largest owner of water in the Murray-Darling River system. The federal government owns 28 per cent of all water entitlements in the southern basin of the Murray-Darling, which means droughts there are experienced earlier and more intensely than would otherwise be the case. This scale of water ownership cannot be justified when the government is unwilling or unable to prepare a detailed water management plan for Australia. What is stopping you from taking the necessary action to reduce immigration until we can create nation-building water projects like the hybrid Bradfield scheme or like? Minister representing the Minister for Water Resources, Drought, Rural Finance, Natural Disaster and Emergency Management, Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. And, um, after listening, there was a lot in that, Senator Hanson. Um, the question I heard was what I was going to do about reducing immigration levels, um, and I'm not responsible for immigration policy in this country, and neither is the minister order, I represent. Order, Senator McKenzie. I'm oh, very, Senator very Hanson happy, though. Senator Hanson's got a point of order. I'll call you after that, Senator McKenzie. My point of order was my question related to what are you going to do, yes, immigration, but to create nation-building water projects like the hybrid. Okay, um, Senator, order. The, the question: the minister is entitled to be directly relevant to any part of the question you asked, including the preamble, Senator Hanson. Um, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Hanson, for the clarification. I'm more than happy to go to the question around what we are doing in the Liberal National Government around building nation, uh, building water infrastructure. Uh, we are getting on the job with building new water infrastructure to meet the needs of regional Australia. We've committed more than $3.3 billion in funding through the $1.3 billion National Water Infrastructure Development Fund and the $2 billion National Water Infrastructure Loan to build dams, weirs and pipelines. Our government has already committed more than $990 million through the fund to co-fund the construction of 21 water infrastructure projects, with a total construction value of about $1.98 billion. Funding is flowing to build projects in your home state of Queensland, Victoria, South Australia and Tasmania. These vital water infrastructure projects will increase water availability to our job-producing agricultural regions and will create over 4,600 jobs and provide access to more than 45,000 megalitres of new, secure and affordable water. Our investments in these projects will guarantee new and affordable water for regional Australia into the future and unlock the economic potential for new and expanded agriculture right across regional Australia. In addition to bringing new water infrastructure, the government is providing more than $119.5 million for 51 studies to get water infrastructure projects off the drawing board, including more than $59 million for Urana Dam, Emu Swamp Dam, Order, Hell's Senator Gate McKenzie, Dam time and for the Big Rocks expired. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question? Yes, thank you. Um, the separation of water ownership from land was brought on because of the Howard government in 2004, and it has created a double-edged sword. Because anyone can buy water as a commodity and then hold that water in dams year after year while regional communities go without. Why have we allowed 20 per cent of groundwater and 15 per cent of water licences to be owned by foreign ownership in Australia? And I'm relating my question mainly around the Murray-Darling Basin. Senator McKenzie. Uh, well, thank you, Senator Hanson. And on behalf of uh, the minister responsible for water and the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, uh, Minister Littleproud, uh, I am confident that our government is doing everything it can uh, to ensure that in the environment gets its entitlement of water, but that the socio-economic security of the communities that you and, and we uh, want to see grow and prosper is maintained. And that is why our government, uh, in conjunction with states, governments of the, of the Senator basin— Senator Hanson, on a point of order. On a point of order, my question is directly relating to why we have got 20 per cent of groundwater and 15 per cent of water licences are in the hands okay, of foreign Senator owners. Hanson, that is that my question. Of, that was part of your question. And I remind all senators that ministers are entitled to be directly relevant to any part of a question asked, including any preambles. I call the minister to continue. 
Uh, thank you very much. And, and you're going to the ownership of the water licences. Uh, obviously, that has been an issue raised by many stakeholders throughout the basin, and that is why the minister responsible, Minister Littleproud, has actually requested the ACCC to conduct an inquiry into uh, water licensing holding arrangements, which is being conducted as we speak. So I'm sure you, like us, want to see the results of that inquiry as soon as possible. Senator Hanson, final supplementary question. In that case, then, if you've actually got to put uh, pull another 450 gigalitres out of for the Murray Darling and the environment, no, that's not you're so you actually. Let's got, uh, sorry, my question. Right. Order. That. Senator Hanson, please continue. Senator McKenzie, please let the senator right. ask the question. The, Order on my the, left. If I will give the, the senator if, extra time. Please continue, Senator Thank Hanson. You. If that be the case, that for the environment, um, as I said before, the government owns 28 per cent of the water um, in the Murray-Darling Basin. So, if the foreign ownership of the water is to the extent of 12 per cent of the groundwater, 15 per cent of the licences, will you then take back that water allocation from the foreign ownership order, and give Senator it back Hansen, to the I've granted you substan substantially extra time, given the interruptions, Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, Senator Hanson, we want a transparent uh, approach, an accountable approach to how uh, the water within the basin is actually accounted for so that all Australians can have confidence that, yes, our environmental assets are getting uh, the water that we all agreed they should, but importantly, those communities and those irrigators uh, are actually also having water that they need to sustain uh, everyday living and indeed productive agricultural capacity throughout the basin. Uh, that is why, for the 450 you were talking about, we actually instigated a socio-economic test with a range of criteria to be assessed and agreed before any of that water can be recovered. Point of order, Senator Hanson. My point of order is: Will the government look at um, the taking back those foreign-owned water licences to get the water Senator back? Senator Hanson, um, the third time you've raised the point of order by restating part of your question. It's not an opportunity to restate well, I've the part. Well, I've got 17 seconds left for the minister. Well, oh, Senator Hanson, please resume your seat. Senator Hanson, resume your seat. I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question. Points of order on direct relevance are not opportunities to restate a preferred part of a question. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Senator Hanson, obviously, water licensing uh, is the purvey of the state governments within the basin. Um, I'm sure they'll look at the ACCC recommendations into uh, water licensing arrangement uh, and water purchasing arrangements very closely, and order. then Senator that all forms time there. Time for the answers expired. Senator McDonald. My question is for the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia. Minister, the coal industry contributes around $5 billion worth of, of royalties for schools, hospitals and better roads across Australia every year, and it accounts for more than 53,000 direct jobs, mostly in regional Australia. Are you aware of any proposals that would put this important industry and the thousands of jobs it supports at risk? The Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Macdonald for her question and recognise her strong passion to support jobs in regional Queensland, particularly North Queensland. A lot of those 50,000 jobs are up there in the north, and, and I know herself and myself and the whole Liberal National uh, government uh, are there to support jobs in our resources sector, support jobs in our coal industry, and want to see that thrive and grow. Unfortunately, Mr. President, there are those that are continually trying to talk down our nation's biggest export. This year, this week, sorry, this week, the Australian National University hosted a forum. Saying it was a, quite, it was a, the title of the forum was the Coal Transition Forum here in Canberra to discuss jobs in North Queensland. And at that forum, Mr. President, at that forum. Uh, the Shadow Minister for Climate Change, Mr Pat Conroy, Conroy, gave a speech in which he said that global demand for thermal coal is in structural decline. He said that there's a proactive role for government in achieving a just transition uh, for the coal industry, and he said that Labor will continue to work on alternative policies for a just transition. Now, when we hear the words just transition up there in North Queensland, it sounds a little bit confusing. What is exactly a just transition? Well, the Labor Party, thankfully, uh, did actually outline this before the last federal election, and in their policy, in their own documents, the Labor Party promised to establish a just transition authority to help plan for and coordinate the eventual closure of coal-fired power stations and associated mines. They said that the authority will, as a minimum, 
have the power to implement pool redundancy schemes for workers in coal-fired power stations and mines. So the Labor Party, the so-called Workers' Party, were going to establish a bureaucracy here in Canberra to put people out of a job. That was going to be the job of the Just Transition Authority under a Labor government here in Canberra. The people in North and Central Queensland aren't fools. They know that they're not fighting for their jobs. They're going to put them out of a job. And the Labor Party, we need to understand where they are post the election because Joel Fitzgibbon, the chef, Mr. Fitzgibbon, the, the Shadow Minister for Resources, is out there saying that global coal demand will go up and that Pat Conroy saying it will go down. Which one is it? Senator Macdonald, the supplementary question. What would be the impact of such reckless policies on Australia's coal communities, particularly in my home state of Queensland? Order, Senator Canavan. Well, uh, Mr. President, um, I think it's best when you want to know what's going to happen in a particular area where change might occur. You might actually ask the people who live in those areas, and and so. I know, and I know Senator Macdonald knows living in these areas. We talk to people about what might happen if these things happen. And I know people like Mr Kel Appleton, who's the publican of the Grand Hotel in Claremont in central Queensland. You know, he, he spells it out very clearly. He says, people don't realise that if the mines close, so do the towns. That's, right. That's exactly what happens. Mr. President, if the mines go, the towns go, the schools go, the petrol stations go, the news agents go, the jobs go. That's what happens. And that's why we are supporting the development of uh, these communities, supporting the development of our great coal industry, our nation's biggest export. We'd like to see it bigger and better and create more jobs, more wealth for regional towns, and more opportunities for the families that live in central and north Queensland. Senator Macdonald, the final supplementary question. What is the global outlook for the coal industry, and what are the benefits of using and exporting Australian coal? Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, um, despite the views of the uh, Shadow Minister for Climate Change, uh, in fact, the outlook for the coal industry, and particularly the Australian coal industry, is a is a is a fantastic one. It's fantastic because uh, the growing demand for energy in our region means that countries will continue to demand high-quality resources, and we are lucky enough to be blessed with some of the highest-quality coal in the world. And so that will continue to be a very strong industry for our nation as long as we allow it to do what it does best. Indeed, the International Energy Agency, Mr. President, predicts that in the next 20 years, or by 2040, that uh, the demand for thermal coal will grow by almost 500 million tonnes of coal equivalent over the next. 20 or so years. The Australian industry, we only produce just over two, or about 250, including our domestic needs, million tonnes a year of coal. So it's an incredibly opportunity for our nation to capture if we support these jobs, if we support these regions, and of course we also continue to provide high quality energy to the rest of the world. Senator Steele John. Senator Steele. Senator Steele John. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, uh, Senator Rustin. Between 2014 and uh, 2017, the New South Wales Ombudsman uh, found that there were no less than 42 deaths of disabled people, uh, preventable deaths in New South Wales residential care, including 11 deaths uh, via choking. During this period, uh, Commissioner Ryan was a senior public servant of the very New South Wales Department for, uh, responsible for the care of these individuals. And of these 42 preventable deaths, the Ombudsman found that there were two where a direct link existed uh, between the death and a programme that Mr Ryan oversaw. In the light of these conflicts of interest, can the government understand why disabled people, particularly in New South Wales, feel like they are being asked to disclose to their abusers? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President, and, and I um, thank Senator Steelejohn for his question and his extraordinary advocacy on behalf of people who live with disability. Um, the Morrison government stands by its appointments to the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect, and Exploitation of People with Disability. Um, the panel of commissioners is representative of a diverse range of backgrounds, which includes lived experience of disability, judicial and policy experience, and Indigenous leadership. Um, the two individuals uh, to which um, Senator Steelejohn uh, referred this morning in his motion and the one he's just referred to in his question to me um, have made significant contributions in their fields, uh, as evidenced by the receipt of um, a Public Service Medal and a member of the Order of Australia. 
However, in relation to the specific appointments um, to the Royal Commission for into um, the Disability Royal Commission, uh, as with any other Royal Commission, uh, is a matter for the Attorney General, and I'll take the, uh, that uh, the rest of the question on notice. Senator Steele, John, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. From 2010 to her appointment uh, to the Royal Commission, uh, Miss Barbara Bennett, PSM, was a senior public servant working for the Department of Social Services. The very agency, she would be aware, um, has direct oversight of the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Given that this process has, at times, by the government's very own admission, failed and led to participants uh, being harmed, uh, can you understand the frustration felt that such individuals would be appointed to a position uh, to investigate their own department's actions? Senator Rustin. Mm. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Steele, John. Um, I probably uh, best to refer to my answer to the previous question because it's a very similar question to the one that you asked about uh, the other commissioner that you're referring to. Um, however, as I said in the previous question, I will refer um, any of the details and the specifics of the question that you've asked me to the Attorney General. Senator Steele, John, a final supplementary question. Given that more than 60 disability organisations, senior disability advocates, and now this very chamber have called on the government to replace both Commissioners Ryan and Bennett with individuals supported by the community that will give evidence before this commission. Will the government now commit to urgently replacing these two commissioners? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, the Morrison government stands by its appointments, but I would also like to put on record in this chamber that it is the Morrison government that set up the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse and Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability, and Order. that the Prime, Minister, the Prime Minister himself is an extraordinary, extraordinarily strong advocate, extraordinarily strong advocate for supporting people with disability. And I look forward in a minute, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr President, to actually explaining to the chamber some of the initiatives that the Morrison government um, has put in place and intends Order. to put in place to support people with disability. And Senator Steele, John, I look forward very much to working with you in my capacity as the Minister for Social Services to make sure that we can make the lives of all Australians, particularly those with disability, better lives. Order. Order. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. I refer to the government's proposal, proposed changes to superannuation default insurance. From 2003 to 2016, more than 3,400 workers lost their lives on the job. Of those, 335 were under the age of 25. Why does the government want to deny young workers and their families the benefits of cost-effective default insurance? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. I completely reject the premise of that question. The government doesn't want to do anything of the sort. Uh, the government uh, supports choice, though, and the government supports uh, measures which help ensure that, uh, in particular, small superannuation balances aren't inappropriately eroded by fees. Uh, going into the pockets of uh, you know, insurance providers in relation to insurance that, are, that might not be appropriate to their needs. Now, I mean, this is obviously a matter that has been discussed for some time uh, you know, in this chamber, and uh, this chamber has indeed uh, already passed some reform, some important reform in this space, uh, designed to protect the retirement savings uh, of uh, working families around Australia. And the government stands uh, by uh, the measures that we've put forward. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. The Police Federation of Australia argues, it's, argues it is extremely difficult to find individual, total and permanent disability TPD coverage and income protection outside the existing public sector funds due to the dangerous nature of police work. Why does the government want to deny young police officers and their families the benefits of cost-effective default insurance. Yeah, yeah. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Again, uh, I don't accept the premise of the question, but we support people choosing the insurance they need according to their needs. 
Like, oder I, I, I know of course that uh, I, I know of course that those officers oder are standing up for particular vested interest. I mean we've got a history uh, with oder all of this. We've got a Senator history Corman, with all of this. Senator Cormann, I have Senator Wong on her feet. Point of order. Order. Senator Canavan, please. The question Senator goes to young police officers. Is the minister suggesting they are a vested interest? Uh, with all due respect, Senator Wong, that's not a point of order. Um, there was a great deal of noise, and I could barely hear the minister, who does have a very strong voice. Can I ask senators to be silent? Senator Cormann. Uh, we stand on the side of uh, young police officers and young nurses and young uh, workers in the retail sector and, indeed, young Australians all around Australia. And we don't Order. want their small superannuation balances eroded by excessive fees and excessive and excessive fees in relation to services that they often don't even know that have been contracted on their behalf. So, that is entirely appropriate and uh, that is a, a, a very transparent position uh, that the government has adopted for some time. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. In March 2012, a 22-year-old fourth-year carpentry apprentice suffered a prolapsed vertebrae and a severe neck strain while on the site on, in New South Wales. Why does the government want to deny young apprentices the benefits of cost-effective default insurance? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. We don't want to deny anyone uh, the access access to insurance. Order. That I, that we, Order we don't deny left. anyone access to insurance, but we but we actually respect individual Australians to make their own choices. Order, order. Senators Keneally, Wong, McAllister. I'll assume that was an observation. Um, Senator Bragg. <laughs> My question. Order. <laughs> or, please. Yeah, yeah. Order on my left. Order Thank you. on my left. There were observations earlier in the week about people asking their first questions. Senator Bragg. Class houses. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services. Would the Minister advise the Senate as to what the Morrison government is doing to improve the employment opportunities for people with disabilities? Senator Rustin. Hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And can I thank Senator Bragg for his uh, first question, despite the, uh, the interjections, and also acknowledge the presence in the, in the gallery of, uh, of his parents, who must be tremendously proud. Um, but look, thank you very much, and thank you very much for this extremely important question. One of the things that a strong economy does for Australia and for all Australians is it provides job opportunities, and none could be more important than providing job opportunities for people with disability. Because this government, the Morrison government, believes in encouraging people, we believe in encouraging aspiration, providing opportunity, and uh, rewarding effort. Uh, so we want people who live with disability to have a choice and some control around their life so that they can achieve their goals. So one of the things that we have done is uh, we have invested, and the Morrison government has announced an investment of $3 billion into the Disability Employment Services um, Program. And through this program, we particularly want to target uh, workplace initiatives such as workplace modifications and adjustments so people with disability can find it easier to work in their workplace, support, uh, support of wages, uh, wage system assessments, uh, wage subsidy schemes and a national disability recruitment coordinator. Um, and just last year, the Morrison government uh, changed the Disability Employment Service Program to help more people with disability to find a job. And I'm pleased to say that 234,000 people uh, use the Disability Employment Services Program. And through this program, we are seeing improvements in the results uh, for people with disability achieving the outcomes that they want for themselves. We've seen participation rates increase by 21 per cent. 41,000 people are accessing support, the support that they need, and 15,000 people have not only been assisted in finding work, but also in remaining in that work. On this side of the chamber, we believe it is our responsibility to do everything we can to get all Australians back into work, and that includes Australians that are working with disability uh, and living with disability to get a job as well. Senator Bragg, supplementary question. There is a mis misconception that when you have a disability, you may be less employable. What is the government doing to remove barriers to employment for people with a disability? Senator Rustin. 
Thank you very much, and thank you, Senator Bragg, for your follow-up question. Well, of course, we want to make sure that all Australians who live with a disability have the ability to contribute to the Australian economy to their best possible ability. It's not just good for them, it's good for their families, it's good for their community, and it is good for the Australian economy for everybody and anybody to have a job. Last year, the Morrison government kicked off the Employ Their Ability campaign which was designed around creating awareness um, of uh, the ability and the contribution that people with disability can make into the workplace. Um, we're pleased to announce that we have already encouraged 105 large companies and organisations to recognise the benefits of employing people with disability. And we went to the last election with a suite of measures uh, that we thought, whilst ambitious, we think are absolutely achievable. We've uh, asked the public service to make sure that 7 per cent of the people uh, who are working in the public service uh, have, have a disability. Uh, we've also uh, um, announced $45 million to develop a national disability gateway, amongst a myriad of other initiatives. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. What opportunities are there to celebrate the achievements of people with a disability? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Um, look, as I mentioned earlier, we really want to make sure that people with disability get the opportunity to contribute to the economy and to society um, to their fullest ability. Uh, but we think everybody can play a role. It's not just the role of government. And can I acknowledge um, Dylan Orcott, the recently uh, re-crowned uh, Wimbledon champion, for the launching of his foundation and the dedication of its objectives towards finding unemployment. Uh, gaining employment for unemployed people with disability. And I congratulate and commend Dylan on this fantastic initiative. Um, because we need to raise awareness so that we can celebrate the opportunities uh, and the contribution of people with disability. And one of the things that I announced this week was uh, Kurt Fairley, who has been announced this year as the patron of International Day of People with Disability. It's held on the 3rd of December this year. It's an annual event. And this year we're particularly encouraging schools to become involved. So any schools out there, please post on your Facebook page about how inclusion and support and recognition of people with disability is a good Order. thing. Senator, Rustin. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Birmingham, the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and the Environment and Energy. Uh, whilst trying to justify his decision to vote with the government to protect Minister Taylor, Senator Patrick today said, and I quote, I have been shown evidence that Mr. Taylor was asked to make representation on behalf of some constituents. End quote. What evidence was Senator Patrick referring to? Will the Minister undertake to table a copy in the Senate? The Minister representing the Minister of the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Wong for her question. Uh, I, uh, uh, I did not have any conversations with Senator Patrick. Uh, uh, I'll take the question on notice. Oh. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Oh, yeah, Order. He perhaps you might wish to talk to Senator Cormann. Minister Taylor's brother is a director of Jam Land Proprietary. Order. Minister Taylor's brother is a director of Jam Land Proprietary Limited, the company in which Minister Taylor has a financial interest and which owns land at the centre of the allegations against Minister Taylor. Was Minister Taylor's brother one of the constituents who raised concerns with Minister Taylor? Senator Birmingham. Oh, Mr President, I'll, uh, if there's anything further to add in relation to constituent representations, I'll bring that back to the chamber as, uh, as I again uh, have stated to the chamber before very clearly. Mr Taylor's interest in Guffey Proprietary Limited has been uh, declared appropriately on his register of members' interests. His interest in Jamland Proprietary Limited is held indirectly through that interest in Guffey Proprietary Limited, uh, but is certainly a matter of the public record. Senator Wong, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The meeting that took place following representations by Minister Taylor, then, Ministers Frieden, then Minister Frydenberg's office and members of the Department of Environment and Energy was revealed as a result of documents released under Freedom of Information. Can this minister explain why the evidence Senator Patrick referred to earlier today as a basis of justifying his protection with the government of Minister Taylor was not released nor referred to in any part of that freedom of information request. Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, uh, that, uh, that of course depends on what the scope of that freedom of information request was, uh, which, uh, uh, which again, having taken the first and primary question on notice, if there's anything that informs an answer to, uh, to that further, uh, I'll bring that back to the chamber too, Senator Wong. Senator Scar. Thank you. Order. Thank Order, Senator O'Neill. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Youth and Sport. Will the minister update the Senate on the government's commitment, commitment to the South East Queensland bid for the 2032 Olympic Games? The minister what are the risks? Oh, sorry. sorry, Senator Scar. What are the risks if the Queensland State Government delays its decision to back the bid? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And Thank you, Mr. President, and I uh, thank Senator Scar for his question, and uh, I understand his obvious interest in uh, the very exciting bid for the 2032 Olympics that's being proposed, particularly by the South East Queensland mayors. Uh, the enthusiasm for that bid from the Prime Minister, uh, the appointment of Mr Ted O'Brien as the Prime Minister's representatives to uh, uh, push the bid forward, uh, and the opportunities that that bid will in fact bring for South East Queensland. Uh, we were delighted, Mr President, to see the Queensland Government finally come on board uh, with some action for uh, participation in the uh, process to bid for the 2032 Olympics. I must say, though, Mr uh, President, that they were somewhat lacklustre. Uh, the Commonwealth Government put $10 million on the table to support this bid during the election campaign, which has been welcomed by the mayors of South East Queensland uh, and, of course, the Australian Olympic Committee. Uh, the process has been uh, I think very well set up for Australia to be in a very strong position to be successful for this bid, but the Queensland government have effectively offered some in-kind assistance. Uh, they need to get on board properly. They need to join the Australian government. They need to join uh, the Australian Olympic Committee. They need to join uh, the community of South East Queensland uh, in being actively supportive of this bid, and they are not. They are putting a very slow time frame on their uh, economic impact survey, which needs to be completed quickly. They're saying they'll do it next year. It should be done this year. We uh, face the possibility of losing the very exciting window that we have to be a leading nation bidding for the 2032 Olympics to bring all of the advantages that that brings to this country. And I certainly urge the Queensland Order, government Senator to Colbeck, actively time get for on the board. Answers expired. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. In addition to backing the South East Queensland bid for the Olympics, how is the government supporting sporting organisations who look to bring international sporting events to Australia? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. In addition to the $10 million that we've already put on the table, towards the bid for the uh, Olympic Games, and the opposition demonstrate their complete ignorance of the situation that exists around the opportunities to bid, and perhaps that's why the Queensland government is so slow. We've also put, uh, put also almost $20 million on the table to bid for other opportunities for global sporting events to come to this country. Uh, we're backing the Football Federation's bid for the 2023 FIFA uh, Women's World Cup. We've also announced funding for, to support bids for the 2027 uh, World Netball Cup and Rugby Australia's 2027 uh, bid for the World Cup for that. We're also assisting in the promotion and preparations for ICC's World 2020 World, uh, World Cups for men and women in Australia next year. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister outline the importance of hosting international sporting events to the development and growth of Australia's sporting industry. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and thanks to Senator Scar for the supplementary. And it demonstrates the importance that these events and the industry of sport can bring to the Australian economy. Uh, currently, Australia, in Australia, the sporting industry employs a workforce of more than 220,000 people. It's responsible for spending of more than $12 billion through sport and sport infrastructure each year. That's why this is so seriously serious. Securing major international sporting events, such as the Olympics, not only inspires the next gener generation of athletes in this country, but it also strengthens Australia's sports industry. It strengthens those numbers that I've just talked about. Our government's also committed to the development of sport, the sport industry growth plan, uh, and we announced that as part of our 2030 sport plan, which was presented by Senator McKenzie 
last year. Uh, we have a very, very strong commitment to the sport sector in this country and the employment that goes with it. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Resources and Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. In 2015, in a dissenting report to the Economics Reference Committee on the matter of privatisation of state and territory assets and new infrastructure, the minister said, and I quote, continued public ownership of business operation can place the government in a conflicted position as both regulator and <laughs> provider of services. Does this minister still believe that government cannot be trusted to operate public assets? Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Well, look, uh, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, I, th I thank the I thank the senator for uh, this, this opportunity to um, travel down memory lane, so to speak. I think you mentioned the report was in 2015. Is that right? Uh, I can't actually recall the, the Senate committee report myself. I, I can't I can't necessarily, therefore, confirm or otherwise the specific quote uh, that has been made. Uh, from it, I can't, you know, recall myself whether I was the author of those words or simply a signatory to them or otherwise. So it's a bit hard uh, to comment on something that, of course, is well outside the portfolio of the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia. But what I would say, uh, just briefly, on, on this particular topic, I think the quote goes to a pretty central uh, point about governance and policy making. It's not a matter of trust, uh, Senator Gallagher. It is about making sure, of course, that. Uh, uh, that uh, objectives are met, uh, different objectives, different, uh, uh, different responsibilities are, are met in independent ways across policy making. But as I said, I, I'd have to check the record before I could uh, confirm or otherwise the, the status of a Senate committee report from, I think, around four years ago. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, uh, perhaps another trip down memory, memory lane, Senator Canavan. In another dissenting report of the Economics Reference Committee, the minister said, and I quote, in respect to the sale of Medibank Private, an exemplary case of privatisation done well. Given rising health insurance premiums and the steady decrease in Australians purchasing private health insurance, does the minister still by, stand by his comments that the privatisation of Medibank was an exemplar? Senator Canavan. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Well, uh, Mr. President, I'm going to have to plead absolute ignorance there. I, I can't actually recall at all. <laughs> Um, a Senate committee inquiry of that nature, but look, that was—I'm not sure what year that one was in. But, uh, but look, I, I, I'll, I'll again maybe have a look and see if there's anything to add here to that uh, question. I, I, I do confirm to the Senate, though, and to you, Mr. President, that I, I was a, a regular author of dissenting reports in my time as a Senate backbencher. And not that I'm encouraging uh, anyone. Uh, uh, in our Senate team in this practice, because as you can see, this is what may come back to bite you. So, uh, so just be very careful about what you do to all the new senators that might be thinking to go down this path. Senator Gallagher, final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and a more contemporary uh, question. In the Brisbane Times, a report last week, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg left the door open for the re reintroduction of asset recycling schemes which would force states to sell public assets in order to access infrastructure funding from this federal government. Does this minister support further privatisation of public assets that will affect people in his portfolio area of Northern Australia? Senator Canavan. Uh, well, thank you, Mr President. Um, uh, well, again, a, a quote from a, from a newspaper article I haven't seen. I, I can't uh, confirm or, or otherwise know the, the veracity of that quote and whether it does indeed reflect the, the views or otherwise of the Treasurer. Obviously now you're asking me a question that's well outside my portfolio, so I'd refer any questions around that uh, to the Treasurer. Of course, that previous scheme that the Senator referred to uh, only involved the uh, decisions of state governments, so it was state governments that made decisions around those things, and it's appropriate for questions around that to be placed to them. Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed on a notice paper. Thank you. Senator Canavan, I was informed you were seeking the call. Sorry. Um, Mr. President, I seek leave to correct. Uh, no, sorry, I don't seek leave. I rise to make correction to an answer I gave to a question from Senator Patterson yesterday. Uh, so, Mr. Mr. President, I, I, uh, in answer, after reviewing the Hansard from question time yesterday, I, I believe perhaps an incorrect impression may be given from, from what was written there. Uh, uh, I 
the, the, I want to clarify that uh, the federal government is investing $50 million in hydrogen research across both the ARENA programs I referred to and the Future Fuel CRC. Uh, I thought, after reviewing the hands out, it might have been uh, left, a, left an impression that over $70 million had been provided. So, just correcting that. Senator Wong. Yes, Senator Wong. Uh, I can't recall. I don't think I need to seek leave, do I? He's just corrected. I'm seeking to just make, respond to Minister Canavan's correction. I do have to seek leave. You'd seek leave seek to leave, make a brief statement in response. No, I appreciate uh, the minister coming in and correcting the record. Uh, uh, it is a standard that um, uh, should be adhered to, and one that uh, uh, I think some ministers on the other side, and particularly in the other place, should adhere to more regularly. Senator Cormann, will you? Oh. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Cormann to the question asked by Senator Mariel Smith. As our population gets older, ensuring a fair and proper superannuation system is vital. This is especially the case for women who have child-raising breaks in their career and have a longer life expectancy than men. In the early 90s, the very idea of compulsory superannuation was by denounced by the LNP, those opposite, and the business lobby as a company killer. That unemployment would rise and, and the economy would be damaged. All that was wrong, of course. And now we have the LNP again, led by Senator Bragg, telling low-income earners that superannuation isn't working for them. A bit rich that someone on over $200,000 a year can tell someone on less, on less than $50,000 a year that you don't need a decent retirement income. Exactly. How dare they? Yes. And not to be left out on his own. In the other place, we have Mr Tim Wilson and Mr Craig Kelly, who also want to talk about the planned super rate uh, rise to 12 per cent being handed to workers as a pay rise not as a superannuation. These guys, these, this LNP uh, government, want to get their hands on the superannuation of workers. They want to take it away. They want to stop getting the rise. And Senator Cormann stood here today and said that he refuted that. But he didn't actually rule it out that it would not be in the review. He didn't rule that out. How dare they come in here and talk of, tell people on low incomes that they're not worthy of a decent retirement income, that they look forward to their retirement existing on the aged pension. That's what they expect them to do, and not having extra to enjoy those little things in life, like maybe a visit to their interstate family or that little trip that they could not afford in their younger days when they were raising their kids, but struggle every day on a pension to pay their power bills to buy food, to buy medications, and all that again while existing on an age pension. And we know that women have less superannuation than men. And I've highlighted that in many times in this place. That until the Superannuation Gu uh, Guarantee Act came into place in the early 1990s, many working women had no retirement savings at all. And there were many men who also had no retirement savings until that act came into place. But let me tell you a little bit about the working women. Women currently retire with 47 per cent less superannuation than men. Women live five years longer than men on average. Women only receive a third of the government tax concessions on super. Men actually receive the other two thirds. 40 per cent of older single retired women live in poverty and um, experience economic insecurity in their retirement. 46.9 per cent of women in the work are in the workforce. So it's, the statistics are skewed. 44 per cent of women rely on their partner's income as the main source of funds for their retirement. The average female salary is $44,000, and that includes part-time workers. 
Female graduates earn $5,000 less than male graduates in the same role. Women spend an average five hours more per day caring for children than men. 43 per cent of women work part-time. The statistics are glaring. And yet they earn under $50,000, and what the backbench over there are supporting and in the other place is that that money that goes into that superannuation fund should not be going into a superannuation fund for these workers to retire on. It is outrageous. Women take an average of five years out of the workforce to care for their family. So what we're seeing here again and again are deep divisions in the government ranks, with the Prime Minister yesterday urging—not yesterday, but he has been urging his MPs to go through the usual internal party processes. But there are a growing number of Liberal MPs who are agitating this issue. To them, I have four words, and to the Prime Minister, hands off our super. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Your time has expired. Senator Mackenzie, were you seeking the? Yes. Uh, well, it would normally be um, the government. Yes. I was seeking the call first. Yes, but I, we normally go side to side, Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, isn't it interesting how afraid those opposite are of bright ideas? This is the season of maiden speeches, and thanks to a very successful election outcome by the Liberal and National parties on May 18, you're going to hear a lot of new ideas from our bright new senators and MPs elected in that uh, particular election that Australians chose to back uh, the Liberal National parties and our candidates to continue to deliver a strong economy and uh, to continue to work to ensure that that strong economy delivers local jobs right around Australia. Because we're not afraid of ideas. So you're going to hear a lot of different reasons why people have come here. On your side, you'll only hear one reason. My union has a view and it wants it expressed in the Australian Parliament. That's all that you will be bringing here and your new senators and MPs. That is their contribution to this place, that my union needs me to stick up for them here in this place, whereas our new members and senators have a whole range of things they want to see delivered over a period of time, and their maiden speeches are the time to do that. What you shouldn't get confused about is a maiden speech by a new senator or MP and government policy. Two very different things. Two very different things. We're not afraid of new ideas, and we look forward to discussing and debating those. The many wonderful ideas that have been raised, some, some old chestnuts as well that you know, always get dusted off and brought out at maiden speech time, over the course of their careers. But the government's position on superannuation is clear. It has not changed. And to try and use uh, people's uh, contributions here in their maiden speech, the philosophies that they've all brought, the diversity that our party rooms uh, bring to this place, to use that as somehow a, a, a proxy for government policy is just ridiculous and actually shows how desperate you are, uh, how despondent you are on the result of May 18. Our government's policy on superannuation guarantee hasn't changed. Let me be unequivocal on that. And to come into this place and bray on as if you know, somehow we're going to dismantle the retirement of, of senior Australians on the back of someone's maiden speech is absolutely ridiculous. Our focus, focus on superannuation is actually to get rid of high fees, duplicate accounts, underperforming funds and unnecessary insurance. Because one thing we want to see on this side of parliament is that Australians, hard-working Australians, get to keep more of their own money. We did that by promising income tax cuts. And thanks to this place passing those income tax cuts in the last sitting, uh, more Australians—94 per cent of hard-working Australians—will get an income tax cut over coming years, getting to keep more of their hard-earned cash. We don't apologise for that. That is actually why we sought election and is actually part of our mandate. 
Australians need to have confidence in our superannuation system and be assured that it's going to be used for its core purpose, which is actually providing income into retirement. Our government believes it's essential that the superannuation sector be managed with the highest level of responsibility and integrity for the benefit of members. If only we could be confident that the Australian union movement could be managed in a way that workers could have confidence in its integrity and that it was actually going, being focused on members' interests and not on the interests of the union thugs uh, such as John Sector. I'm really looking forward to Anthony Albanese explaining how supporting the expulsion of Mr Sector from the Labor Party but not supporting legislation that would actually make it Senator happen— Senator McKenzie, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator uh, the Gowing. Senator, the appropriate title of the person in the other place. Uh, yes, I just remind uh, you, Senator McKenzie, to refer to others by their correct title. Mr Anthony Albanese. Uh, well, how Labor can not, is not supporting legislation to ensure that members of unions can have confidence in the integrity uh, and the responsibility of those managing their money and the millions of dollars uh, that the Australian union movement uses. At least $30 million of workers' money is being siphoned annually from militant trade union-owned worker entitlement funds that are meant to administer workers' money for workers' benefit. This is what our legislation in the other place is seeking to address. So instead of coming in here and mistaking a maiden speech for government policy, why don't you get serious about supporting Australian workers and support— Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Your time has expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I too rise to take note of uh, the question asked by my colleague, Senator Smith, to uh, Senator Cormann. And, and in doing so, I want to say completely at the outset that Senator Cormann's statement about all this was transparent throughout the election campaign, all this was all part of uh, the policies we put to the people. I just want to use one example of uh, Senator Bragg's speech, and it goes to the point we have the fourth largest private pension pool in the world with only 25 million people. The next sentence is, it remains a huge and strange experiment. Where, in what land, does someone come and make a contribution in this chamber about having the fourth largest saving pool in the world from a relatively small population become somehow a huge and strange experiment? It is a very successful example of what Australia can do well. It's not without challenges. But you never went to the election saying you're going to delay superannuation payments of up to 12.5 per cent. You never went to the election and said we've got this strange, huge experiment. We've actually got too much money in workers' retirement accounts. Try and sell that out there. Now, Senator Bragg, I mean, I think it was Alan Bond who said you only ever get one Alan Bond. Oh, Kerry Packer said, you only ever get one Alan Bond in your life and you've got to take the chance. Maybe the senator will be the one we get. We'll only get one Senator Andrew Bragg, who is so ridiculous in his ideology that he's going to go and try and tell 10 or 12 million Australian workers they've got too much money in their accounts. They've got too much money. It's a strange experiment. What a load of, you know, come on. Anyway, we're lucky to have him. This is good for us. I'm sure that people who have a 80, 90, dollars $100,000 investment account in super are going to look at his comments and say they're more than passing strange. I get a comfort from having a retirement balance of whatever amount. And if I get TPD, income protection and, dare I say, life insurance and a respectable group life insurance policy, I get some comfort from that as well. And Senator Ricard is exactly right. There is no greater example of the disparity of the waging of the earning capacity of women than in superannuation. Their accounts are invariably lower. They're invariably out of the workforce for longer periods of time. And they're always lower paid. Almost always lower paid. So I've had people put it to me that the actual value of that superannuation account for most of their 35 or 40 working years 
is the security of having group life insurance for death, TPD and income protection. And when they do get to that retirement phase, they have had that security overlay in all of their working life. If you lot take it away, if you lot take it away for younger people, for less fortunate people in the workforce who earn less money, what happens when they get injured? What happens when they're totally and permanently disabled and can no longer work? What happens if, unfortunately, someone gets killed and they've got dependents? I actually know, because we used to have a barbecue. I worked at mine sites where we donated a day's pay after a death. I know what the system was before. And you lot want to take us halfway back there. It's an absolute disgrace. And you let loose those ideologues over the back there. The Pattersons, the Stokers, probably never done a decent hard day's work in their lives. You let loose those ideologues. Um, Senator Gallagher. Can I uh, Senator Abetz, Senator Abetz, wait for the call. Senator Abetz. Ahead. Can I remind Senator Gallagher of his own point of order that he raised against uh, Senator McKenzie, and that is that people in this and the other place ought to be referred to by Thank their public Thank you, Senator title. Abetz. And I'll remind you to please um, uh, direct your remarks to the chair. And Senator Gallagher, uh, again, um, people need to be referred to in this place uh, by their correct titles. Please uh, continue. Uh, look, absolutely. My attention is always to uh, refer to the other side with the appropriate title. And uh, I don't know whether ideologue is the point of order, but uh, I don't really think that that's uh, disparaging. I think it's a correct description of uh, some of those on the other side. S senator Gallagher it was using their last names without their title of senator. Oh, I thought it, well, I said yes. Senator Stoker and then Patterson. Yes. Okay, so Please continue. thank you. Point of order taken. But look. The, the reality is we know what the world was like prior to 84, 86, 87, when unions actually created industry super funds. And we know how immeasurably better the world got in 92 when it became the superannuation guarantee. And we've had 27 years of uninterrupted economic growth, and our pride in our savings pool should be you know, a national pride. We can do better, and no one on this side of the chamber says anything other. But to take away that security overlay that is there in group life insurance is fraught with real challenges, and it will impact the most vulnerable. And you need to see that rather than the tax take in the Ford estimates of $600 million. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Your time has expired. Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. You know the Australian Labor Party is on the back foot when they raise as the issue of the day two sentences out of the most rookie senator in this place from his first or from his maiden speech, to pick two sentences out of an excellently crafted speech and try to make that as the issue of the day tells the Australian people yet again something they already know, that the Labor Party is devoid of a forward agenda. They have no policies to pursue. Indeed, today's great agenda item for the Labor Party is to attack two sentences in Senator Bragg's first speech. Really? Is this the best the Labor Party can do? Regrettably, the answer is yes. That's the best they can do. And why is it that the two particular senators that raised this issue felt so compelled to do it? All you've got to do is ask, what did they do before they came to this retirement home for washed out trade union officials. Ah, oh, they happen to be trade union officials, trade union bosses. And from this super scheme that uh, Senator Bragg referred to, who are the great beneficiaries? Ah, oh, happens to be the trade union movement. And the trade union movement milks funny money from these funds. And guess where the money finds its way back to? To the Australian Labor Party. And guess what they do with it? Run campaigns to elect their union officials to this place. It is the full circle of the money go round of ripping off workers to then ensure that the Labor Party gets sufficient funds. And why do they need these super schemes? Because the union officials that have just spoken have seen a decline in trade union membership. They can no longer run themselves on the basis of the voluntary contributions of workers wanting 
to join a union. Membership in the trade union movement has collapsed. It is now about one in ten in the private sector. Ninety per cent of Australia's private sector workers don't want to be in a union. Oh, how do we get money out of them in that case, asks the Labor Party, if we can't force them into a union anymore? What better way? Have a super scheme with a few little add-ons which can be milked to ensure a stream of income for the trade union movement. And that is what we've seen today from the contributions of Senator Urquhart and Senator Gallagher, both former trade union officials concerned about their funding stream for their unions for their ongoing longevity. Now, let's be clear. Labor senators come into this place basically as the ventriloquist dolls from the trade union that they formerly represented. Whereas senators that come in on this side of the chamber come from a unique and varied background. A unique and varied background. They aren't ventriloquist dolls for certain interests. They are not cookie cutter type senators that come from the Labor Party side. All individuals with good dynamic ideas that are worthy of consideration, worthy of exploring. And as the Leader in the Senate quite rightly said, just because a new senator in his first speech explores a particular idea in two sentences out of about a 20-25 minute speech does not make it government policy. And that is why the Labor Party latching onto this shows the desperation of the Australian Labor Party. No ideas of their own, nothing to offer by way of a positive contribution, nothing to suggest how the cost of living pressure might be able to be reduced for the Australian people. They say, what is the issue of the day? Let's pick on two sentences from the speech of a brand new senator who floated an idea for consideration. And whilst the Labor Party continues to wallow in this type of activity, the Australian people will quite be quite right in their ongoing rejection of the Australian Labor Party, and I would encourage them to use this facility in the Senate to take note of answers, to advance positive ideas Thank you, for the Senator benefit Abetz. of the nation. Your time has expired. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And what we're doing on this side of the House is seeking clarity, better information, understanding. Uh, the desperation is not from this side of the House, Madam Deputy President. The desperation is in those families who are struggling to feed their children, who are struggling to live on uh, CDP, $11 a day, who are struggling to live on Newstart. Uh, that's where the desperation is, Madam Deputy President. So when a senator comes into the chamber and brings forward ideas, uh, we naturally will ask and examine, well, where is the government going on this? Uh, how can Australians bank on what Senator Cormann says when members of his own government are touting more interference, in this case, in superannuation? Just in the Northern Territory alone, Madam Deputy President, we have a figure of more than $200 million in lost and unclaimed super owed to the people in the Northern Territory. Now, I realise that this may be a small amount uh, in the nationwide figure of $17.5 billion in lost super, but it is a huge amount for a population of less than 250,000 people and 30 per cent of the population in the Northern Territory are First Nations people. So it is imperative that when an idea, a concept as important as superannuation is even questioned, then of course we need to challenge and ask the questions around it. We have an ever-growing number of government members speaking out and undermining assurances from senior cabinet members about superannuation increases. It should be straightforward. These increases should proceed as guaranteed in law. Yet we even have brand new senators talking about what they want to see happen with superannuation. Good luck to them, obviously, and welcome to the Senate. 
but also welcome to the scrutiny that is required of each and every senator. We all know that. Now, Senator Bragg made a very interesting first speech last night, and much of it I was very happy to hear, in particular around First Nations and the voice to parliament. But he also threw in the idea that, for some reason, superannuation contributions should be voluntary for low-income earners. So people who are low-income earners can look forward to an old age of poverty. You know, these are the questions we have to now examine and ask. Or maybe they can live on the pension that Senator Rustin thinks is so generous. Senator Bragg's statement that First Nations people should be rightly and properly recognised in the Australian Constitution are really to be applauded. He's one of the first members of the government to support the inclusion of an Indigenous advisory body in the nation's founding document. But again, what is the government's actual position on that constitutional recognition of Australia's First Peoples? So when we're coming in here and talking about superannuation, there is a lot that the government can be turning to in its attention to making sure the super system is working for all Australians. I've given you the figure in terms of the people of the Northern Territory. Recently, a Victorian charity called First Nations Foundation was in the top end helping Territorians, particularly uh, residents in our remote areas. Uh, as we know, again in the Northern Territory, over 100 Aboriginal languages are spoken. Those people were able to listen to the First Nations Foundation on how they can reclaim their lost super. This is a massive struggle for First Nations people and others with English as a second or third language uh, living in remote areas to understand our super system. I mean, oh my goodness, you can have the best education and understanding the super system is still a complex process. So imagine for those people who have English as a second or third language. It's extraordinarily difficult. The Arnhem Land Progress Association Chief Executive Alastair King has rightly said the superannuation industry really needs to lift its game for people living in remote regions. In areas where internet access is poor or basically non-existent, it can be incredibly difficult to access this sort of information. Most people don't even know where to start looking for their lost super funds or even know they had superannuation funds they could roll over or access. The superannuation system has been pretty slow in adopting strategies that protect vulnerable customers. That's why this side of the House needs to keep you guys accountable. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senate, Senator Urquhart to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against the ayes have it. Uh, Senator Seawitt has advised me that she's splitting her time between herself and Senator Steele. John, Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, today I asked the Minister for Families and Social Services a series of questions, of which he could so answer. Taking, sorry, sorry, I'm taking, taking note. note of the answer to my question about Newstart um, on, of the Minister for Families and, and Social Services. I asked three questions, none of which the Minister could properly address. I asked her why the government continues to call Newstart a transition payment when the average length of time on the payment is three years. It's clearly not a transition payment, so I'd say that myth about Newstart is busted. I also asked the minister about older Australians on Newstart. Today we heard it was reported that the Prime Minister says if he wants to uh, increase any payment, it would be the age pension. And we have the ridiculous situation where we have someone at 64 living on $287.90 less than someone on the age pay at pension at 65 and a half, for example. That is ridiculous. New start needs to be increased because if the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, cares about older Australians, he would realise that being stuck on New Start is harming those very older, Austra older Australians that he professes to care about. My last question was whether the minister could live on New Start, on New Start, without uh, having already paid, with already having paid the rent, but also with the energy supplement, because that's the one thing that the government keeps saying is that. People on Newstart, another myth, another myth 
get all these other payments so they don't need a rise in New Start. $0.65 cents a day, $17.65. <laughs> Could the minister live on it? No, of course she couldn't answer that question because, of course, she knows you can't. She said it wasn't meant to be easy. She said in her answers that it was um, not meant to be a salary, it was a safety net. It's not a safety net, it just drops people straight through. Of course she can't live on it because nobody can live on that. We need to raise New Start. It needs to happen immediately. It needs to be at least $75 a day. Thank you, Senator Steele. Is yours on the same matter, Senator Steele? Uh, different matter. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Seawitt be to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Steele, John. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I uh, this afternoon would like to address the response given by uh, Senator Ruston to my questions in relation to the appointment of Commissioners Ryan and Bennett to the Disability Abuse Royal Commission. Well, that was no answer at all. Three questions I posed to the minister. Could she understand our frustration? Could she see why we felt like we were being made to uh, disclose to our abusers? Would the government listen to the united cause of the disability community and now the united voice of the Senate and call on these commissioners to resign? And what was the answer? Oh, they're very eminent individuals. They have AOs, they are PSMs. Well, that is no answer at all. I would remind the Chamber that there are many eminent people throughout history. I believe Rolf Harris was one that could claim the Order of Australia. It goes nowhere near addressing as respectfully as should be done the legitimate concerns of the disability community in relation to this matter. Now, I know that it is difficult for any government to admit they made a mistake. Genuinely, I understand what a difficult thing that is to pull off. But you have made a mistake here, and you are putting at risk what would otherwise be one of the only legacies with which I would credit part of this government, that being the Royal Commission. I would ask the Chamber, have disabled people not suffered enough? Have we not fought long enough? Can this government not grant us this small moment of justice and victory? I would beseech you, in the deepest and most heartfelt terms, to listen to disabled people, to take on board the message that we are sending to you and to work with us to reappoint these commissioners. Finally, I would like to speak directly to Barbara Bennett and John Ryan this afternoon. I know that this must have been a difficult 24 hours. I know that you will be feeling hurt and shock like you have been treated wrongly. But let me tell you, this isn't about how you feel. This is about our ability to trust this commission. Thank you, Senator Please Steele, do John. the right Your thing. Your time has resign. expired. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Steele, John, to take note of answers. Be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister.